further ado, Thank you. welcome. Thanks, Pat. Um, yeah, so do you know what kind of, has anyone here voted on the deep old machines before? Yeah, so they're touch screen, right? And no paper, right? Are they TS, do you happen to know? Are they TS or TSX? <laughs> My guess is that they're the TS machine. Uh, okay, so, yeah, they're probably TS. So uh, this is actually an old slide, which I thought I'd have to throw away, but it's kind of topical all of a sudden. Um, um, this is sort of my view of internet voting. I don't know if uh, I'll have time to get to internet voting, but hopefully this will give you an idea of my thoughts about it. Uh, obviously, I didn't make the cartoon. So um, as Joe Stalin said, um, those who cast the votes decide nothing. Those who count the votes decide everything, or Teresa Lepore, a uh, former Republican turned Democrat who uh, is, is the person responsible for the butterfly ballot said, we always pray for large margins. Uh, now, just a brief history for why e-voting has become such a hot issue. Um, Florida 2000, of course, uh, was uh, a major problem. And uh, some people drew the wrong conclusions from Florida. Uh, they looked at the problems counting these punch card ballots and they said, ah, we can't count paper. Uh, conveniently neglecting to remember that banks count paper all the time. Um, lots of uh, other countries count paper ballots without having the kinds of problems that we observed in Florida. Uh, in my view, the correct uh, lesson to have learned from Florida was that you have to use the right kind of paper. And there were problems with those punch card ballots. There are a lot of problems. I won't go into those, but some of them were obvious. Anyway, as a result of Florida 2002, which was another problem, the Help America Vote Act was passed, or HAVA. Uh, HAVA made almost $4 billion available for new voting equipment. Um, and uh, states had to replace the punch card and lever machines by 2006 or seven. It's not really clear. But in any case, most view it as 2006. NIST was supposed to have set standards. But initially, there was no funding made available for standard setting. Uh, and another point which uh, had been overlooked until quite recently by most people who are concerned about this issue is that HAVA also requires every state to have a statewide data, computerized database of all registered voters by 2006. And we've already started to see some major problems with this in the Maryland primary. The database wasn't working well and there are um, a lot of concerns about the way they implemented that database, which hopefully I'll have a few minutes to talk about. Chris Clifton was involved with an ACM study that we did on voter registration databases where we make 99 recommendations uh, aimed at the election officials in the general community. And I would bet that nobody has followed all of our recommendations and many people have followed almost none of them. So um, I'm actually co-authoring a book on this subject with um, Doug Jones, and so I could talk for several days on it. Um, I have too many topics listed here. I thought I would list them because if there's anything that anybody really wants me to talk about, I can skip around. Uh, so what I thought I would do is just start with an overview of the different voting systems. If everybody knows that, I can skip it, but my guess is that not everybody, okay. Um, talk briefly about testing and security. Horror stories are always fun. Um, maybe talk a bit about internet voting. If there's time, talk about legislation that would solve some of the problems, not everything, but would go a long way to make things better. And then these voter registration databases, I've Diebold at the end. Of course, Diebold will get mentioned throughout the talk because we love Diebold. Um, we really do. Uh, Diebold, Diebold, of course, is everybody's favorite as an example for all the problems with voting machines. And I'm sure you all are happy to hear that since you vote on Diebold. Um, but, uh, I just want to say that Diebold clearly has extremely bad security because they couldn't keep their software and hardware out of the hands of computer security experts. But we have no reason to believe that they're particularly worse in terms of the products they produce than the other vendors. Uh, one of the problems, of course, is that the other, most, the, the people haven't been able to really do the kind of examination of the voting machines produced by other vendors that they've been able to do with Diebold. So, um, I'm, you've probably all heard about voter verified paper ballots or audit trails. I just want to go, again, go over again briefly what that is. The idea is that the voter should be able to verify his or her ballot that it was correctly marked and, and correctly recorded. And again, when you have paperless voting machines like what you're voting on, 
you have no way to know that what you selected on the screen is what's stored in the internal computer memory. Right? I mean, this is, this is a no-brainer for anyone who knows anything about computing, but for a lot of election officials, this is a big leap of faith. This is a really hard point to get across. Believe me, it's a hard point to get across. That we have no way to know what's on the screen is what's stored inside the computer. So, um, so when computer scientists started working on this, uh, David Dill was one of the leaders in this. Uh, we were calling for voter verified paper audit trails or paper ballots. Now, um, we've since come to realize that just having the paper obviously is not enough if nobody looks at it. So another very critical component is there must be an audit for every election, always. And actually, the state of California requires that and started requiring it even before some of these touchscreen machines came in because they already had some computerized voting. They had the optical scan systems. And the idea is that um, you want to randomly select after the election some number, some, some machines to, to do a manual recount on. And so typically you'll select particular precincts or particular voting places. So you know what the number should be from looking at the tallies from the machines. You do a, a, a manual recount and you check to see if the number that you got from the manual recount matches the number that the machine set. If it's done randomly, then if there's a malicious player out there, it's hard to know beforehand which machines are going to be counted and which ones aren't. If you did know beforehand, you could just make the ones that you know were going to be audited work right and then just mess with the other machines. So that's why randomness is so important. Again, it's obvious to computer people. It's not obvious to election people. Um, so the idea, oh, and another thing is that sometimes people will talk about receipts. In particular, sometimes people who don't like paper will talk about receipts. You never get a receipt when you vote. The idea, I mean, you might get a receipt saying you voted, but you don't get a receipt which says how you voted, because if you did, you could sell your vote. So you really can't walk out with a copy of your vote. Um, but uh, so, so when you get this voter verified paper ballot, it must stay at the polling place. Uh, and it's needed for the recount and for the audits. So um, that's the idea. And I mean, as Dan Wallach said, you need audit trails to convince the losers that they actually lost. The winners always believe they won. Yeah. Uh, now, one of the types of machines I want to talk about is optical scan. Uh, so it, the advantages are it's a lot cheaper than these touchscreen machines. Uh, you, by definition, have a voter verified paper ballot. The way the optical scan works is you get a paper ballot and you either fill in the oval with a number two pencil, that sort of thing like you did with when you took SATs, or you connect two sides of a broken arrow between the candidate's name and the office, which is more typical. If you vote absentee ballot, you typically will vote on an optical scan ballot. Um, and then what you really want is a precinct-based scanner so that after you filled out your ballot, which you, which you do in the precinct, ideally, you put the ballot through the scanner. The scanner will tell you if it thinks you've overvoted for anything. So if it thinks you voted for two different candidates for president, for example, as happened with the butterfly ballot in Florida, it'll spit out your ballot and you can get a new ballot because your vote won't count in the case that you overvote. It'll also warn you if it doesn't uh, sense any votes on your ballot. Now, you could, of course, design optical scans, which will give you much more information than that, which will read back to you if you have headphones on uh, precisely how you voted, uh, which in my view would be ideal, but you can see there also can be problems if you've got long lines of people waiting to hear how, how they voted. So in any case, those, those aren't on the market now, but certainly technically there's no reason why they couldn't be. Uh, disadvantages are multilingual ballots can be a problem, and uh, clearly somebody who's blind or who has significant motor, large motor problems could have problems filling out these ballots. Obviously, a blind person couldn't read it. There are ways they can vote on these. I'll get to those in a moment. Then there are screen-based systems, and, uh, which, of course, is what you have. And, of course, they have computers in them, although we still have election officials saying, even today, that uh, these machines are not computers. I don't know what they think runs them, but uh, there are people... Uh, yeah? Oh, I'm sorry. The idea being that you have to print out ballots in different languages. And so you have to do more printing. That's all. Thanks. That's, you're right. That's not... But I mean... For, well, in, in places, uh, like in California, there are lots of different languages that are spoken. 
So, in fact, it can, it can require, you can, depending on, how, on the languages that are spoken in a particular precinct, you may end up having to print out lots of ballots, most of which will, many of which will be thrown out because, you know. So, um, anyway, so, so these, these things, these, these touch screen machines, or, or the screen-based systems, I should say, um, have computers in them, so it's easy to have earphones attached so blind people can vote independently, blind people and people with literacy problems. Although, parenthetically, I mean, I've been doing some studying about this recently, and a number of these machines are actually very hard for blind people to use. I mean, they're being pushed as the solution, because HAVA also mandates that people be able to vote independently, people with disabilities be able to vote independently. They're being pushed as a solution for HAVA for this requirement, but in fact, there are a number of blind voters who have reported on this and said some of them are really hard to use, and some of them don't have uh, certain kinds of features, like the sip puff feature, for someone with severe motor, motor impairment uh, that is typically available on a lot of equipment for people with that kind of disability. Uh, some machines do, but most of the, I, I think the Diebold still does not, I'm pretty sure. Um, the language problem is easy on these if they're screen-based machines because you can just push a button to say which language you want, assuming it's been correctly implemented. Uh, they avoid overvotes. If you, vote, if you vote for one presidential candidate, then you vote for a second. The first one will unvote, presumably. Um, voters can modify their votes prior to finalized voting, finalizing their ballots, and they satisfy the HAVA requirement. Uh, now, of course, one of the problems with screen-based systems, if they're, if they're not um, properly set up, sometimes people try to vote for one candidate, and they ended up voting for another one because uh, they haven't, I forget the word, but they haven't uh, um, set it up properly or... So they sometimes can be fairly delicate, so that's another problem. Um, ballot marking and generating systems are also screen-based. Um, they, they basically produce optical scan ballots. So the ballot marking and generating systems, there are at this point two of them commercially available. Uh, the Automark, which is being marketed by ESNS, and the Populex. And I'll just tell you how the Automark works. You take a blank optical scan ballot and you put it in the back of the machine and then you do screen-based voting like you would with um, a touchscreen machine. You can have the earphones. It actually does have a sip puff option. It's very good for people with disabilities. Um, at the end, it just marks the ballot. It does not record anything. And it does not count anything. So now you have a marked optical scan ballot, which you could put into a precinct-based optical scanner, uh, although in all, you know, it should be marked correctly because it won't let you do overvotes because it behaves the same way as the other machines do in terms of not letting you overvote. So um, many of us think that's a really good system that can be used in combination with precinct-based optical scans that will allow uh, people with disabilities to vote independently. Now, um, one of the problems with all of these machines that I've told you about so far, if someone is blind and deaf, you can't use it because blind people have to depend on the headphones for input. Um, Populex is another one of these systems. Uh, I believe it, I know it's used in places in Illinois. Um, and it's a stylus, it's use a stylus in this case to mark the screen, and it prints out an optically scannable ballot. So tactile ballots are low-tech uh, form of voting, uh, actually don't have computers. And, um, and they, they use feel as a, as a form of input. And um, there are, so the, Rhode Island actually has been using tactile ballots for, for a long time. You basically put a template over the optical scan ballot the template has, is encoded so that blind, and I think, you, I think you use headphones, I'm not sure. A blind voter, it probably also has Braille, but a lot of blind people don't read Braille anymore. Uh, so they can vote, they can, they can determine what the votes are for, and uh, then there are holes where they can fill in for the optical scan ballot. So they don't have to be able to see, they can feel. They can feel it. Uh, VotePad is a new uh, system that's out. Uh, it basically is a ballot sleeve that fits over the optical scan ballot. Um, it can be, both of these can be used by blind and deaf voters. And VotePad also has a nice feature that um, a blind voter can verify his or her ballot because there's a vibrating wand that you can put over the ballot and you can get the feedback from the headphones that says how, it, how you voted. So the machines that are, that are most controversial is what you have. They're called Direct Recording Electronic, or DRE. And these, again, are screen-based. They're usually touch screen. Uh, when they first came out, most of them had no voter-verified paper ballot. 
So the way you would vote is you would touch the screen. At the end, you would say, finalize my ballot. Your information would go into the computer, would store the information, it would count it, it would produce the results. And uh, you had no way of knowing if the information, if your ballot was correctly recorded. And that's one of the reasons, that's the main reason actually why computer scientists started getting involved with this because uh, we know enough about computers to know that there are way, that there could be software bugs or there could be malicious code that could be used to subvert this sort of uh, device. Um, when you have no audit trail, and these machines, initially most of them did not have an audit trail, testing and security becomes really, really important. And again, something which a lot of election officials didn't appreciate is that they, these machines have to be securely stored prior to, during, or just before and after an election. Uh, they were told that these machines in the long run would be a lot cheaper than optical scan because it's a buy once only. Uh, you don't have to be printing out paper ballots every year. Uh, they weren't told about the storage costs and the testing costs. Uh, they weren't told that they would have to have contracts with the vendors to do maintenance. Some of these contracts are fairly expensive. They become, and, and the election officials become very dependent on the vendors. Once they've bought these machines, they need the vendors to provide the support. Um, and uh, of course, even with DREs, if you have absentee ballots, you usually end up having to print paper ballots anyway. So um, I think that in many respects, they were sold a bill of goods. But the bottom line is the current testing insecurity is grossly inadequate. So even even so, we don't have good testing and security. DREs will be used by nearly 40% of voters in 37 states in the upcoming midterm election. There's a small number of vendors nationally. The software is secret. In independent computer security experts are not allowed to view and test the software. Even when code is held in escrow, and there have been cases of this happening, independent experts are not allowed to view the code, even if the election is being challenged. Now, the DREs that originally did not produce paper ballots that these were the main ones, Diebold, Sequoia, ESNS, and Hard InterCivic. Uh, now, I think all of them, uh, it says here Diebold and Sequoia, but I think ESNS, well, of course, ESNS has the Automart. Uh, but I think they've all been retrofitted to produce a continuous rule. Maybe ESNS, I think they're claiming that theirs will now cut. Maybe Sequoia is saying that. But the idea is that, that these machines already had a thermal printer on them. And the reason it already had a thermal printer on them is that when you begin an election, you're supposed to print out a zero tape that shows that there are no votes recorded in the memory. Now, of course, as Harry Hursty pointed out, one way you can really trick this machine is to have negative votes for one candidate and positive votes for another, so they add up to zero. And that's a good way to get the election started on the right foot. Uh, but anyway, you print out the zero tape, and if you trust and believe, you know, then you believe that these, it's sort of like with a, when in the days of ballot box, you hold, all, you hold the ballot box up and you turn it upside down, you show that there are no, it's not ballot stuffed in the ballot box. This is supposed to be equivalent, but it's not really. Um, anyway, so, so they retrofitted these machines when people started making a fuss, and they retrofitted them in using awful engineering, but of course they were already badly engineered to begin with, so they were being consistent. Uh, and it's a continuous roll of thermal printed paper in most cases. So um, this means, first of all, there are privacy concerns. If you know the order in which people went to vote, you've got this record of how they voted in order. When their votes are stored in the computer, they're supposed to be stored randomly. I don't know if they are or not, because of course, people haven't been able to check that, but they're supposed to be stored randomly. But on the paper, they're clearly stored consecutively. Uh, but what's much more disturbing to me is that it's very hard to do an audit or a recount using this continuous roll of thermal paper. Uh, if you think about how you want to count things, you want to count things the way a bank does, right? If you want to count dollar bills, you sort them into piles, the ones, the fives, the tens, the twenties, and then you count each pile. And, and this can be done in a very transparent way. So you can say, see, there's a one dollar bill, goes in the one pile. Twenty dollar bill goes in the twenty pile. And then you can have different people counting the piles. You can have, in the case of ballots, representatives of the different candidates or the different parties counting and recounting. You can have it televised. It can be very, very transparent. With these, with these, these thermal printed papers, somebody has to say, okay, well, here we've got a vote for Kerry, and, and, and down here we have a vote for Bush, and someone else is sitting, around, is sitting somewhere making marks, and it's very untransparent and very hard to do. And time-consuming, uh, you know, when you can just sort the ballots, it's much faster. So um, it's really a bad system for lots of lots of reasons. Uh, however, it's better than nothing. 
Uh, and everybody, you know, we'll, we all will say that it's better, it's really bad, but it's better than nothing. Now, there were originally a couple of DREs that produced paper ballots. Uh, the Avanti vote tracker had a ballot under glass, not to be touched by the voter, and the Acupol, which went bankrupt in 2006. Uh, and I mentioned here the federal s standards. There, were, there are some federal standards for these machines. As I said, they're pretty bad. Uh, the oldest is 1990. A lot of machines on the market today still have only been certified to the 1990 standards. There are 2002 standards, which were written, obviously, later, which are somewhat better, but still not particularly good. Uh, and then there's a new set of standards, which have just come into effect. Anyway, uh, both of these systems had paper ballots as their initial design. And this quote from the CEO of Acupol, this is the company that went out of business. He said, I do not feel that any of the vendors has a system that voters can trust. I think that vendors outright misrepresent the robust, robustness, stability, and security of their systems. You have just to look at the litany of problems, and it points to one thing, bad fundamental design, and not enough checks and balances. I also wonder why the other vendors were so adamant in fighting a VVPAT, that's Voter Verified Paper Audit Trail, system requirement. They spent much more in fighting it than in implementing it. So currently, as I said, 37 states are using DREs, 27 or 28 of them mandate VPATs, but they don't audit it necessarily. They don't audit them. They just require them, but they don't necessarily look at them. Um, uh, another eight have VPATs because of purchasing decisions, for example, optical scans. If you've got an optical scan system, you automatically have a VPAT system because the voter fills out the ballot. And if you're interested, there, uh, there is a map that shows the states and the um, auditing requirements at the Verified Voting website. Uh, I should say, uh, full disclosure, I'm on the board of verifiedvoting.org. Uh, they also have a lot of good information there. Uh, now, um, any comments or questions? Yeah, Greg. Of course, you'd still have the audit requirements, wouldn't you? You still have the problem. Oh, I see. I mean, you still have to do the. I mean, it's not as easy as sorting piles to count them. You still have to put the number of votes on each. Sorry, Chris, you want to say something? Also, it would be, it would be, comp it, it, it would be, I mean, you, to retrofit these machines to do that would be very expensive and complicated. And why not just have a decent printer? Right, but you still have the auditing, still have the auditing plan. Yeah. I mean, how many have they sold? How much money? Uh, I actually don't know the answer to that. I do know, as I say, that almost $4 billion federal money was made available. And of course, states and counties are also kicking in some money. Um, it's, it's, I, I don't know what the size is, but I do know that um, it sort of was a gold rush mentality because there was this deadline and there was this big pile of money. So you had a rush to market and you had a rush to buy. And you had people making purchasing decisions who really didn't know what they were doing. I mean, in all honesty, they didn't know what kinds of questions to ask. And they tended not to consult the technical community. Um, and they still, and there's, there's, there's really, I mean, there are some election officials who really are interested in what the technical community has to say. Uh, but, but there are a number who feel, who, who are quite hostile, you know, who uh, most, you know, we've been called um, Luddites and fear mongers and things like that for pointing out these problems. It's not a good situation, and um, there's a lot of politics. <laughs> when there's money, there's politics. Yeah. Well. Uh, you had mentioned the, uh, the problem with the proprietary nature of the software. Um, it would seem that this could be Well, one of the things that's happened is that uh, a lot of the contracts that have been signed reinforce this, this, um, this notion. In other words, uh, election officials sometimes say they are not allowed by contract to show the software to outside independent experts. Uh, 
this often is mandated in the contract, and this is the kind of contract which election officials have signed. So yes, there are efforts being made to, to uh, in fact, Rush Holt's bill, H.R. Uh, 550, uh, which is the best bill around for this, would, would forbid any kind of secret software. Uh, yeah, that actually has members of the House have endorsed it, but they haven't been, not been able to bring it, get it brought to the floor. Uh, and I think one one reason is the voting machine close to the election. Um, I don't know. Hopefully, it's it's a good bill. HR. Uh, it'll probably have a new number next time, but basically what it does is it mandates always a 2% random manual audit for all elections, 2%. And uh, it also has some, some more details to make sure that, that, you, that enough things are covered by this audit. Um, it forbids secret software. Um, and it also, um, let's see. well, I have, I, I, there's, there are a few other details. Which, uh, in it, I mean, it also requires um, accessible voter verified paper audit trails, which um, many of these machines don't produce. So, needless to say, there's a lot of opposition. Testing security and standards. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. yeah. Uh, if, if a randomly selected machine goes through an audit uh -huh. and is found to have an error, mm -hmm. where Good question. I think that holds Bill, I'm not positive, but Ideally, what you want to do is to have a complete manual recount, right? Because if there's a, the only reason for doing an audit is to see if the machines are working right. And if a machine isn't working right, you don't know if the other ones are. So logically, you want to have a full audit, full manual audit of everything, full manual recount. Um, election officials don't like doing that. So uh, like California has, this 1 has a 1% random manual recount. But that's what the law says, and then it stops there. It doesn't go on to the next obvious point which is and do a complete count if there's a problem now um, uh, my guess is if, if it turned out that you did the audit and there were discrepancies that turned up and people knew about it then there would be a demand for a full manual recount now whether or not it would be conducted again you know our laws don't match our technology and sometimes people demand things but they don't happen so. any other questions Come. Measures. So the security through obscurity argument is used a lot. Uh, the idea that these machines are more secure if you keep the software secret. And uh, obviously, uh, I don't have to explain to folks in this audience that that's not a, a sound argument from a computer security perspective. You always want to assume that your adversary has complete information and that your system is so secure that it can withstand attack nonetheless. Um, the machines are insecurely stored and monitored. Um, I had the experience of working in the 2004 election as a poll worker. Uh, I was assigned to a, a polling place in a commons room in a dorm on the Stanford University campus. And a week before the election, uh, our paperless DREs were dumped in the commons room. Um, the woman who had arranged for it had asked them to at least bring them when she was there so she could move them into her office. So she came in to work, and there they were. So she then had them carted into her office where she kept them under lock and key for a week. Now, I am sure she didn't do anything nefarious, but had she been inclined, she could have done it at her leisure. Uh, or somebody else with a key to her office, like a janitor or someone like that. The night before the election, we had to come back. Well, come. I hadn't come there before. We had to come, come to, the, to the commons room, set up the machines, and daisy chain them. And so basically, we plugged one into the wall, plugged the second into the first, the third into the second, the fourth into the third, and fifth into the fourth. And the reason for that is that a lot of polling places don't have adequate number of outlets, electrical outlets, or they may not have them in the positions that it's convenient to vote. So these machines are designed to be daisy-chained. We had to set them up the night before so that the batteries could all be charged in case there was a power outage. There were two levels of protective tape, uh, so-called tamper-proof tape, on these machines. The first, was that we the first level we took off to do this setup, and the second level we were supposed to take off the next morning when we came back before the polls opened and got the machines actually turned on for voting. Um, I had never seen this tape before. It did have numbers on it. No way to know, looking at the tape that we saw, that this was the original tape. No way to match the numbers. Presumably it was. 
Um, the machines were left overnight in an open commons room. Anyone could have come in, done anything. Now, one good way, uh, one very simple thing one, that, that could have been done uh, just to create uh, disenfranchisement would be to go in and take off the second level of tapes. Just take them off. Not do anything. Because our instructions were, if, that, if we came in and there was any problem with the tapes, we had to call up and get new machines. So there were some machines that were held on reserve. But we got there at 6 and could barely open at 7. If we'd had to get new machines, get them all set up and everything, people who had been waiting in line to vote wouldn't, you know, couldn't have stayed. I mean, it would have been sort of like Ohio with these long lines and people waiting for a long time. Uh, furthermore, if this were widely done, and I assume that a lot of the machines were, were, were kept in places which were not secure, maybe not as insecure as a commons room, but still not secure, and people had gone around and just removed the tape, it would have caused, caused chaos because they clearly wouldn't have had enough machines. So that's just a really simple way to disenfranchise people. Uh, obviously, there are more sophisticated things one can do. Uh, this tamper-proof tape is available on the Internet. Now, I don't know if that particular kind is, but probably, you know, it's commercially available. I mean, Santa Clara County didn't produce it, so you have to be able to get it. So that's an example of the kind of lack of security. Yes, Chris? Now, do you have no way to verify the tape? When you, when you remove that, did you save it and send it Yeah, we, were, we, we saved the tapes. And they were turned in with the memory cards. So presumably they were checked um, when, the when everything was turned in. Now, what happens if the tapes were wrong? What do they do? I mean, what do you do if the election's already over? Um, and that's, that's a real issue. So these, um, these machines are supposed to go through testing by so-called independent testing authorities. Not exactly independent, uh, because the vendors pay for the testing, and the vendors get the test results. Uh, we, don't, we can't see them. They're secret. Um, the te the n no uh, COTS, no commercial off-the-shelf software is tested, because that's proprietary. So Diebold, for example, uses some Microsoft software. Nobody looks at that. Um, they, don't do an, they don't do a code review in the sense that a computer that, 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 that a Silicon Valley vendor would do a code review. They have a checklist, which they go over. Um, I mean, we don't know exactly what they do, but I know they do this kind of thing. They check um, for single entry, single ent exit loops. They check for adequately commented uh, statement, statements. They check for, for lengths of, of, of statements, things like that. And the things they check for are all reasonable, in my opinion. I mean, I don't think they check for, out, you know, they don't have outrageous requirements on this checklist. But the point is, and, you know, you don't have to be a computer security expert to know this. You can't do computer security by checklist. Because if somebody is going to do something malicious, you're going to try to hide it. You're going to try to do it in an unobvious way. And it's not going to be the sort of thing you can necessarily find with a checklist. You have to look at the code carefully. You have to examine it. You have to see uh, where things go. You have to do, I mean, people know how to, how to do this. And even so, even so, bugs are not found. You know, I mean, that's why companies like Microsoft have to put out bug fixes per, uh, frequently. I mean, they, they try to find the bugs. They can't find them all initially. So, again, this is a notion which is very hard to get across to somebody who hasn't done any programming. That the notion that it's, that you can, that it's not that hard to conceal a Trojan horse, to conceal malicious code in a huge, complex piece of software. And especially if it's not well tested. It's not that hard. And, and this is just a very hard notion to get across. I think people think of software as being like a book where you have an editor who can just read through it and check. I mean, I think that's what they think of it as being like. So this is the current situation. Secret code, secret testing, secret test results. No recounts possible for paperless DREs. And the retrofits uh, for those that have been retrofitted uh, are poorly engineered. Parallel testing is, uh, is something which has been proposed by DRE proponents as a way of checking on the machines. The idea is you take machines, again, randomly selected, out of operation on election day, and you run a simulated election on them, and you check to see if they pr produce the results that they should produce according to the simulated election. And the, uh, the argument being that if they do produce the same results, you have reason to be confident that there's no malicious code. They rarely even talk about software bugs, but you know, presumably no, no software bugs either. Um, this is a good thing to do, but 
first of all, of course, there are problems because people can't afford to take many machines out of operation because these machines are so expensive. Secondly, sometimes the testing isn't done in a way that, that wouldn't be discernible by the machine. But even assuming that it is done in a way that, that is not discernible, there is this big what if, which is what if you find a problem? Just like with the tamper-proof tapes, what if you find a problem? Um, we, don't have a, um, we don't have laws for rerunning re -running elections. And I'll give you a concrete example of that in a moment in horror stories. So just to talk briefly about Diebold. Um, Harry Hursty examined the Diebold TS6 and TSX DREs uh, and discovered a back door. Now, um, back door means it was there intentionally. And the reason it was there was Diebold wanted to make it easy for election officials to upload software patches. Uh, now, of course, the back door also makes it easy for people to upload malicious code. Turns out it had been detected earlier in earlier reports, which people just didn't catch. So Diebold knew about this for several years and didn't do anything about it. Uh, I mean, I can go, I don't think there's really time to go into details about some of these other reports, but um, if we had more time, I would discuss them. Anyway, so I've already mentioned that, and I'll skip. Well, there's this one good quote from David Baer, the Diebold spokesperson, who said, for there to be a problem here, he's talking about the back door, you're basically assuming a premise where you have some evil and nefarious election officials who would sneak in and introduce a piece of software. I don't believe these evil election people exist. <laughs> and it also ignores, I mean, underlying all of this, you've got the problem about insiders. I mean, how much, you think about all the money that's been spent on elections in this country, how much would it cost to bribe someone who has a, a, a programmer who has access to the software that's produced by one of these vendors? Five million, ten million? I mean, how much? Twenty million? I mean, people would be really tempted, and that's like not, not a lot of money when you think about all the money that's being spent. Okay, I'll skip these quotes. Ed Felton, you've probably heard some of you about Ed Felton. He's a uh, Princeton University uh, professor, CS professor. He and his students developed a virus to rig an election on a Diebold. Uh, TS machine, which I think is what you vote on. He got this machine from he won't say where. Um, I've heard stories about there was a surplus machine on some dock somewhere and someone put it up for sale on eBay and someone else bought it and gave it to Felton, but I don't really know. He won't, he won't say. Anyway, I strongly recommend this, this uh, URL and if you don't, you don't have to bother about writing it down, I can always get, get the, I mean, Spaff probably has it. You can just do a, a web search for for uh, Felton and Diebold, and you'll find it. Um, it's a 10-minute uh, video showing how to install the virus, various ways. It's real easy. Uh, for example, um, the, the key that the, the, the memory card is kept in this slot, which is opened by a key which is widely available. It's many hotel mem mini bars have it. You can buy it on the internet. Uh, Ed has actually bought one of these keys on the internet, uh, and he has a student who could pick the lock in about 10 seconds. Um, so it's not real secure, and you can put in a, um, a different memory card with malicious code easily into this slot. Um, and um, the malicious code being, it works as a virus as follows. They, they, they'll sometimes take, mem they'll, they'll take a card, to start up these machines, they'll, they'll take a card and insert the same card in many machines, and so if it hits the infected machine, it, that, that card can get infected and get passed on. So there are ways of passing on the virus. It's just like, it's almost like a human virus. It's kind of interesting. Via a card which has been inserted into the infected machine. Uh, another way of passing on the virus is when the, the information from the infected machine goes back to the central computer. The central computer is infected, and then it infects all future cards. Um, and Diebold says, of course, this is a minor problem, easy fixed, uh, or he's using old software or whatever, but the fact of the matter is uh, the only way to even hope to fix the problem that they've uncovered is to make changes not only to the software but also to the hardware. Uh, there's a report that just came out a few days ago, which I haven't had a chance to look at yet, from Connecticut, which shows how to steal an election using Diebold optical scan systems. Um, now, uh, again, using malicious code. I haven't looked at it, but uh, Avi Rubin says it's quite impressive, so I believe it is. Uh, now, this points out another reason why audits are so critical, because with an optical 
system, even if you rig the counting, so the, 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 the scanner does the counting, you know, reads the ballot, does the counting. If you rig that, you still are okay if you do a reasonable audit because the audit should uncover the problem. And, um, uh, and then you do a total manual recount. So there are ways around rigging an, uh, an optical scan system that don't exist with a paperless DRE. So this is um, one of my favorite horror stories, Car Carter at County, North Carolina. In 2004, they lost a bunch of votes, over 4,500 of them. Uh, the way they lost these votes is they were voting, doing early voting on a paperless DRE. The counter was set to stop accepting votes after 3,005 of them had been voted. And uh, all the votes after that went into um, a DRE black hole and were completely unrecoverable. They weren't even stored internally or anywhere. They just, nothing. So um, this was a bit odd because it turned out that there was a statewide election for agricultural commissioner where the difference between the two candidates was less than the number of lost votes. So um, Board of Elections will have a new just for the agriculture only in Carteret County, and that was thrown out by the courts. Then they said, oh, well, okay, we'll do it for the whole state, and that was also thrown out. And I think that the um, reason one of the threw it out, threw them out was that they said, well, we don't know the same people will be going to vote with the re-vote. With the re 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 Do you write the law? I think you should just have a, you just rehold the election is what I think you should do. But I can understand the issue that they, they're saying, well, but we should just have the same people re-voting and we don't know how to do that. Um, so then what happened was that there were a number of affidavits, 1,352 of them, that were collected by the uh, leading candidate. And that would have been enough to guarantee that person election. Uh, the opponent conceded primarily because it looked as if the judge was going to accept the affidavits. So you now have a situation where an election was decided by affidavits. Um, let's see, I think I'm, I, I should probably just do Boone County because that's in Indiana. Uh, the initial election results showed over 144,000 ballots had been cast in a county with fewer than 19,000 registered voters, of whom uh, only you know, 5,532 actually voted. Uh, the county clerk said that it was caught, the problem was caused by a glitch in the software. And if you follow this area at all, you'll see this word glitch used over and over and over again. I hate it because glitch sounds like it's minor. And what we are talking about is our democracy. And when something like this goes wrong, it's not a minor glitch, you know, it's a major security, it's a major problem. It's a threat to our democracy. Anyway, uh, because there were no paper ballots, um, um, a technician came in and fixed things and then they got the right number. Right, do you believe that? Okay, so I should probably stop here. Uh, I mean, I've got more, as I say, I could talk a long time about this, but maybe I should stop here and open up the questions. There are no questions, I'll keep on talking. That's, that's what I'm wanting. Are you reading this, huh? Franklin County? Maybe I should skip through all the rest of the horror stories. <laughs> yeah? I'm reading a book that says, was the 2004 presidential election stolen uh, by Stephen Freeman and Joel Lifus? Uh, and what happened was um, Freeman noticed the night of the election that uh, it looked like Kerry was way ahead in all the exit polls. And uh, this is on CNN.com. Um, and then when the election results were, were, were announced, the new exit polls showed that Bush was predicted to win, which he found a little bit interesting. Uh, it turns out when these exit polls are done, at the end they sort of reconcile the exit poll. They, they, they mix in the actual result, reported results with the exit polls until the, finally they all match. Um, and uh, somebody else had apparently done, his, done screen saves of the exit polls on CNN. So he has a lot of the original data, although he doesn't have all of it, and the, and the uh, polling companies won't release it. Um, he's done analyses of it, and he said in 10 of the 11 states where he's done the analysis, um, the exit poll prediction, the early exit poll prediction, uh, 
differed from the re reported results by huge difference statistically uh, and always favored Bush. In the 11th state, they more or less matched. I think that there was a lot of paper used there in the 11th state. Um, you know, you can believe it or not. I mean, I'm not going to say that there was a conspiracy. If you're curious, you can read his book. Um, he makes the argument. Yeah. Another explanation would be that Harry voters were more likely to be right. Yes, and he goes through all those explanations. He goes through all those explanations, and he says these. They, they, there were there were explanations presented. Uh, carry voters are more likely to respond. Uh, women voted earlier, they're more likely to be carry votes, and so on and so forth. And his point is that these are explanations that are given, but there's nothing, there's been no supporting facts given. I mean, these are sort of conjectures. And furthermore, he said that when people do exit polls, they've been doing it for years, and they tend to be very reliable, and they know how to compensate. So, for example, if more women respond than men, the po they, they keep track of that, and then they weigh the male response more heavily to compensate for the reduced number of men who respond. So he thinks that these, that he doesn't have a good explanation presented. Now, you know, I'm not a, a I, I haven't really studied this carefully, so I'm simply telling you, I'm reporting to you what he said. Yeah. Do you want to, you have a question? Uh, yeah, actually, Tuesday coming out for election, should people be worried, obviously, about their security, no matter where they're at, Um, well, of course, one of the problems with, with going around giving talks like this is I don't want people not to vote because they think their vote won't, won't get counted because, as Spaff said, if you don't vote, then for sure your vote won't get counted. Um, I think people should go vote. Um, in California, there's been a big movement to vote absentee ballots, so there'll be paper. And, one thing, and it's probably too late now to do that if you haven't already signed up for it. One thing you can do is you can vote absentee ballot and then deliver the ballot to the precinct, to the polling place on election day so you know it actually gets delivered. I mean, one of the problems with absentee ballot is that there's also historically been a lot of voter fraud with absentee ballots too. They're not an ideal solution. My, I mean, my thoughts are you really do want to go to the polling place and vote. That that's the, that's the best way to know that your vote, I mean, but you want to vote on a secure system. You want to vote on a secure system. And that's what we should be doing. And we're not. But people should, I, I don't want to discourage people from voting. Please do go vote. Please pay attention. And I think that something which is very important is for people to get involved and start asking their election officials about what they're doing and why and start demanding explanations from these people. Hold them accountable. Any other questions? Yeah. So the question, if those, for those of you who may, I guess I should have been repeating questions, but anyway, the question is, uh, what was the rationale for the judges to decide that you can't hold a re-election? Chris, did you want to say something about that? Sorry, I got it. Oh, well, I mean, one of the problems is that there, we, there aren't laws to deal with this. We don't have laws to deal with the question about what happens if the vote itself is suspect. In this case, it was more than suspect. People knew the votes were lost. Um, and in some states, in fact, the, there are laws that forbid recounts unless certain conditions hold, like the, vote, the election has to be within a certain percentage or the losing candidate has to request the recount. In some places, recounts are very costly to hold, so even if those conditions are satisfied, the losing candidate might not have the money to pay for it. Uh, so, so recounts are not something which are necessarily easy to do. As I say, in California, audits are mandated by law. And they are in some other states, too. But nationwide, that's not the case. And that's one reason to support what Rush Holt is trying to do with, help Ameri with the HR 550 that I, mean, I think they should be required everywhere. But Chris, you had, I'm sorry. Oh, 
I should stop now? Yeah. Oh, okay. Should I take one more question or not? Uh, you can have time with references. Oh. <laughs> okay, guys, I've got a lot of stuff I'm skipping through. I warned you. Um, well, this is, this is about internet voting. I mean, there's internet voting going on now, too, guys. Uh, the military is voting by um, internet and fax, believe it or not. Oops, oh, I lost the last slide. Uh, let me bring it up. I should have done this. Okay. Can you see that? So verified voting. ACM has a good web, a good page on voting. And here's another votingintegrity.org. There are a number of websites. Um, I would say verified voting is actually has, a, has some projects going uh, where people are, actually, are going to go to the polls and check and, and keep track on, on, of certain things that are going on. Uh, I mean, for example, uh, one question is, do, do the poll workers check to make sure that the number of votes that are recorded on the machine match the number of people who signed in? It seems like a trivial and obvious thing to do, but it's often not done. In fact, I don't think we did it when I was a poll worker. Well, I can stay around for a few minutes. Stay around for a few minutes, back. And if a couple of you have questions, you'll be here for a few minutes. Uh, otherwise, replies, uh, I'll have those in a day or so if you're interested in um, referring to those. So thank you very much. And I'm just concerned that.